Hi, hello everyone and welcome to this week's Tourism Teacher Talk. This week we have Annette who's come to speak to us about a very exciting topic which is space tourism. So hi Annette. Hello, hello Hayley. Uh, so, uh, oh, I skipped a part now. Uh, so that is supposed to be doing something, uh, sorry about that. There we are. <laughs> um, so, Annette, would you like to start off by introducing yourself? Yes, so uh, my name is Annette Toivonen. and I currently live in Finland in a small town of uh, Porvo, which is a very uh, historical place. And uh, literally, I think it's a good when you are futurist yourself, you need, do need to always uh, remember the history uh, aspects very well. So then it's easy to, well, easy, but it's, it's then you can kind of get an idea what to predict as well, because a lot of things do repeat and such. So um, I am currently a university lecturer in uh, Haga Helia University of Applied Sciences. I've been teaching a space tourism for the past two years. And um, I literally created the course uh, a couple of years ago. This is one of the pioneering courses of the whole world. I imagine I haven't actually found anything similar myself online. It's combining the kind of concepts of sustainable development and uh, the future space tourism together. And how I created the course, uh, the background for that is that I have been doing a PhD thesis since 2015 for the University of Lapland. And I have been investigating and writing academic articles for different journals, uh, peer-reviewed, uh, um, like uh, articles to, to, to make, make it exact. Uh, and I also uh, published a book of mine. Uh, it came out uh, five months ago in the UK. It was uh, published by China View Publications. And it's actually currently selling in 20 plus countries. So that's quite exciting because yeah. it's a pioneering book it's called sustainable space tourism an introduction and literally um uh, I noticed when I started my PhD process, first of all, just to combine something that is sustainable development and then space tourism. Back in only five years ago, it was almost like a utopic sounding combination. And obviously, I got a lot of doubts that can it even be like, what does it even mean? And can space tourism ever be in, is sustainable in any way? So I decided that, you know, since nobody else has done this kind of academic research, I will be then the first one at least trying to make some sense of that. And and that literally then uh, brought me this kind of a book, a book deal. And then uh, my thesis is coming out. Hopefully I, I get my doctorate in the end of this year. So that will be have more, more findings uh, uh, related to that. So that is literally my background at the moment uh, in relation to space tourism. Wow. And I can't imagine there are many people who are have studied space tourism did you find it easy to find supervisors in that topic <laughs> well no no not really because obviously there are not that many people in in uh in this planet that are there are a couple and i have been actually it's a very small circle at the moment who are specializing in a way from the angle they have a background maybe in other industries but so far i know that i'm because I have extensive background in the tourism, tourism, um, like I have been literally my um, bachelor and master degrees are both uh, from tourism research and then also this uh, PhD is from the tourism department. So, and I have been working in the tourism industry in a global positions, mostly maybe marketing and such uh, for over almost 15 years, I could say. So I have really this kind of tourism angle uh, myself, which is something that most people related to space are having some kind of uh, technological or science or such background. So uh, in my case, I really do investigate like a future tourism phenomena, uh, uh, really basing it on the tourism angles. Wow, it, it must be so fascinating. Um, so tell us a little bit um, about it then. So what exactly is space tourism? 
Well, I have been, uh, uh, there have been some definitions made by some academics and you do have different kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, classifications already, for example, like terrestrial space tourism is something that has been existing, uh, or like for hundreds of years already. It's a space, uh, space tourism related activity that we do from the earth. So literally, if you have joined some kind of stargazing trip, or like we have these, um, uh, northern lights, for example, in Lapland, in Finland, and you are literally using your, uh, for example, like a telescope or naked eye to witness some kind of a space phenomena, or you have been visiting like a space uh, center, like a Kennedy Space Station, uh, Space Center in the uh, Florida, uh, and other such uh, like museums related to space and such. That's already kind of classified as you have been like a space tourist in in such. But now we have got this uh, new uh, sector starting, which is going to aim for the suborbital space tourism. So literally taking a human being physically to the low Earth orbit, and now we're talking of these new space companies, uh, Virgin Galactic, SpaceX and Blue Origin, uh, that are really now, they have been building up this infrastructure for the past uh, 10 years and really doing the last final safety checks and really are hoping to get the first uh, tourist on on uh, to space. Virgin Galactic literally is, uh, uh, which is founded by Richard Branson, uh, really is uh, the, the kind of, um, Literally, it just almost could be in, in some months' time that they will be saying that now we can start this uh, activity. And you literally, it is kind of like a space jump. You you go there for for it's kind of a couple of hours uh, journey, and you are literally witnessing, you know, the Earth, uh, the curvature of the Earth for for some, I think. 15 minutes maybe if I have understood it correctly and you are kind of floating you have a possibility to feel the uh like there is no gravity and all these kind of uh unique features now that haven't really been available yet for uh, tourists mm -hmm. on on the planet maybe if you do scuba diving or something that's something that you do have uh, you have uh, you know been able to change the kind of uh environment for your body as a part of the tourism activity but this will be a really different uh like a new new kind of uh, thing to do Obviously, now at the starting price is at 250,000 per this kind of a space jump. So it's literally we are talking about like elite activity, uh, who are able to actually start, uh, practicing and, um, and, uh, trying this. And of course, then, especially from my angle of sustainability, you can then already start facing these kind of social sustainability issues that, uh, you know, the, fairness and equality and such ethical things that what is the kind of you know what does this mean for environment that it's only a small uh, group of people who could actually start doing such thing that actually causes emissions and the rest of us literally are here to breathe those and don't even uh, count up for the access so there are loads of these kind of things that are to come of course but uh, loads of other th good things as well. Mm. And is that the type of space tourism that you've been looking at for your PhD? The low earth, I have been uh, literally a uh, kind of, um, because then you have this astro tourism. So we literally then talking about uh, uh, going to Mars, like uh, SpaceX, for example, Elon Musk is really wanting to colonize. Uh, he has really big plans for really going there and building a colony and also moon and such and all kinds of other kind of whatever, you know. Uh, well, obviously, like Hollywood have already kind of provided us insight. So we do all have a vision of how this could look like like even though nobody has done it yet. So usually when you kind of start forecasting something futuristic, it's actually uh, Hollywood. I mean, you, when you think of the creative people and such, uh, a lot of things have come uh, uh, for our society. When you think of internet, all kinds of mobile phones, they did already exist in some, some 1960s TV shows. Uh, and suddenly they became a part of our daily lives. So it's the same kind of thing that I'm just kind of uh, thinking this as the kind of whole concept of um, uh, the, the general of what is meant by like us leaving the planet. So that has been the, uh, the kind of angle. All right, interesting, fascinating. So hopefully this will, um, how did you get into this area of research? Because it is so niche and it is so unusual. What led you to starting that? 
Well, I was living in the UK myself in uh, early 19. Uh, uh, 10 uh, and I was watching Richard Branson in in TV I think he's a very inspirational person and has really tried a lot of uh, exciting things and I was then thinking of maybe I was a stay-at-home mother with my son and kind of thinking that it would be really nice to kind of start kind of uh, doing PhD and just kind of thinking that you know what is there something is there something that nobody has done yet and uh, I have been working in some companies that um, have been kind of, I was working in a travel agency when this big online reservation boom came. So I have been actually, when I was a student, I was the one who was, uh, somebody wanted to uh, book a holiday. I was the one who was uh, literally picking up the phone and making the reservation. And I witnessed the whole change of like us becoming travel agents ourselves. So I've been kind of show, uh, being kind of uh, through that kind of, uh, big change in the tourism industry uh, via work life. Also, I was working this kind of social media company uh, even before Facebook was really big. This was one of the world's first uh, hangout site for kids. So I was working there as well. And I saw the kind of how social media became a really big uh, kind of uh, a mega trend. So I kind of based on my work experience, this was kind of an easy path for me to select because I was already kind of seeing that this will be a really big a new path part of uh, tourism at some point and nobody has really done any research so that was the kind of uh, the reasons why I chose this area of expertise. Yeah great I bet it's, it's been an interesting journey so you've been doing this PhD since 2015? Yes. And you're due to complete this year that's pretty good going. <laughs> Sorry? That's pretty good going. Some people take like 10 years, 15 years to complete their PhDs. And I have been working quite a lot at the, at the same time as well. And uh, so, and I did my uh, teacher's pedagogical uh, qualifications as well. So I've been quite busy in, in many ways. Ah. But uh, but it has been great in a way, but um, obviously when you are kind of pioneer in something, in a way it's kind of also easy because at least then nobody can really question you because nobody hasn't really even done that part. So <laughs> then you can really be creative and uh, such. But of course it's a hard place because there isn't really anything existing. You really have to create something yourself and really try to put little pieces together and really, you know, so it is, of course, hard work in, in a way. And that's why I wrote the book. So at least the people who, and I've been writing these academic uh, papers that the other ones are coming after me because I'm certain there will be a lot of uh, researchers to, for this field to come later. And at least they have a nicer kind of a starting, easier starting point. So like it's like a package already that, you know, my book, for example, is providing now from, from, uh, for this, uh, topic so you don't have to start from the scratch as I did myself yeah yeah great so tell us a little bit more about your book then how, how long did it take you to write what what are the chapters like well I, can, I actually have the physical copy here as well I took it and I was actually thinking that may, I have to remind myself what I have been writing since my, my thesis is slightly uh, like also has a different uh, things it took me about two years to write and I this is literally just like um, how would I even define it uh, this call it's called an introduction so I have been literally gathering obviously like I have been able to write a book about something that doesn't even take place yet so that's of course needs to be remembered that you have to then really have these kind of uh angles that uh like i didn't want it to become like a fiction book so this is a really like this is also peer reviewed one of the only people uh, besides me this planet uh, has been actually uh, uh peer reviewed this uh from the academic world so that's uh, of course then good that it gives the credibility uh, but in this one I, I just go literally through these uh, chapters what I have been writing so firstly in the first chapter I'm just introducing space tourism literally telling of the industry uh, what what does it mean and what kind of um, like um, uh, like kind of taking to, like a the, 
first going through a little bit history of space exploration and then highlighting some key points of, you know, what's happening now in the new space economy and also defining what space racism meant and also kind of going through the bodily experience and such. And then the chapter two is literally about giving the background to the sustainability, what is meant by sustainable development, what is kind of space racism role in that. Like there is, for example, this 1972, like the Apollo crew took this uh like a blue, uh, it's called the blue marble, uh, the picture of Earth uh, that really became a symbol of environment. And later, later on, we have all seen this, like uh, uh, the planet Earth looking really beautiful. I think uh, everybody in the planet has almost been exposed to that photo. So that actually started a lot of these kind of like environmental awareness uh, uh, schemes in 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 Earth, just because we were able to see, we were kind of understanding how fragile we actually are here. And uh, it's sometimes good to be re reminded of that factor that we are really alone. So it's better to actually really keep uh, and try to protect the earth as much as possible, because at the moment there isn't really a place to escape. Uh, because space environment is really hard on, we are not really meant to be in space. We really have to then think carefully if we are building colonies and such, how to actually, you know, survive in the space environment, because we are not really meant to be there. And um, I also kind of have this uh, case study example. I actually also have this Arctic uh, degree from a university of Arctic uh, in, in Norway. I, I went to field trips to Siberia, uh, Norway and Iceland as part of this kind of Arctic, uh, you know, industry certificate. So I've been kind of taking this as a case study. Uh, when, when you think of Ar Arctic and the space, they are both remote, cold areas where, we're, where you, know, you know, a lot of things are more challenging challenging than in other parts. So there is this kind of like um, conversation in that. And then in the chapter three, I uh, just kind of uh, explore what is uh, futures forecasting. And I'm introducing my model that I created for my first academic journal called um, Sustainable Future Planning Framework that I actually utilized when I built up this university course. That it's kind of like uh, there aren't, aren't really any academic models yet for space tourism, like how to investigate something that doesn't really take place yet. So I decided mm -hmm. that it's then good to maybe, you know, then I create something myself and you can kind of follow it uh, when when uh, it has some key points uh, there that it kind of leads uh, leads uh, the person, uh, like helps in the planning process. And then also uh, in the chapter four, I am talking about the planning of the two-step on space tourism, like the uh, destination life cycles and the uh, linking space tourism and sustainable development together, because those could be linked literally just like when you think of operational level. It's kind of when you're building like space for America is a good example that, uh, you know, when you build a space port, on, on Earth, you could be then using just, you know, making the building process uh, in a sustainable way. And that could be something that is kind of easily achieved as well, because a lot of things mm -hmm. are now following, uh, the, you know, sustainability um, uh, aspects. And also kind of when you think of the space suits, how they are made and such, all that kind of like sustainability could be involved in all those kind of operational processes. And then when you have this um, uh, also, cultural sustainability, and that is something I have been doing myself, raising the awareness, teaching the kind of uh, the next uh, generations when they go to work for these new space companies, that they at least have this kind of, they have been exposed to this kind of sustainability uh, tied up with the new space economy, that it's not only just hardcore science based or technology, but there are also other aspects to consider and such. Mm -hmm. And all kinds of, you know, obviously you have this survival uh, sustainability, uh, survival level of sustainability, which is literally like, a, you know, in case of some kind of a earth catastrophe, but then we actually this has been mentioned by Stephen Haw Hawkins as well that uh, we need we, in case of such uh, catastrophe if we want to really uh, keep human species alive we need to have a kind of um, escape place and that's something that also Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos are kind of visioning at the same time 
also you have a resource level of sustainability uh, kind of meaning that obviously uh, you could go to moon or some other planets or even asteroids and, uh, you know, dig some minerals or materials uh, from there and, you know, not needing to do that on Earth. And then kind of hence preserving our areas in Earth that we can kind of protect those. Of course, then you do face these ethical issues, like what right do we as humans have then to go and ruin other places after we have ruined the Earth? But in a way, that could be a way to save uh, and preserve some of the parts of the planet that we actually uh, produce some of this from space. So uh, those kind of things are touching that. And then in the chapter five, I kind of go through the space tourism and society. Kind of when you think of the just the kind of social fairness points, this will be an elite activity in a way. How does it kind of what does it mean uh, in a way? And kind of going through the space ethics and corporate responsibility, and also kind of just touching the global space birds. When you think you always have when you have a tourism destination or site, you have a local community involved. And when you build up a spaceport, of course, there'll be more noise and emissions, congestion on the local roads and such. So th those will be touched. And then on the chapter six, I go kind of touch the uh, economics of the, you know, the space, um, space uh, of like what is kind of meant in uh, uh, this will be a huge industry, uh, very lucrative, uh, like uh, industry to come. And such, uh, kind of, and then touching the space re reusability. I mean, the only way is kind of, if you think of starting a mass space tourism, the only way to kind of, uh, the only key for that is to really the reusability that you can reuse these rockets and such, uh, as for example, space as now has been doing. And then also, uh, touching the uh, the kind of, um, space legislation points as well. And, uh, Hello. Oh, <laughs> she also sorry. wants to come and listen to the future space tourist, maybe <laughs> <in> herself. <laughs> yes. So, uh, touching the kind of uh, space legislation, which is literally non existent almost at the moment, uh, meaning that there is only this outer space treaty that is legally now binding, and that's from the 1967. So, kind of one of my points as an academic researcher is to really now point out that really there isn't really any legislation now for tourism in space that maybe it's really a good time to start establishing something before this industry even takes off. So, that's something I'm kind of of trying myself to do from the soil of Finland uh, for the uh, you know benefit of the whole earth so we can yeah. all make our yes <laughs> I've never thought of before yes so that's kind of you know this yeah so um and then my final chapter is just the visions of sustainable space tourism what it could be and that kind of comes from the uh uh when i've been uh in interviewing some uh professional related to space sector and such and also you know doing these um uh, surveys and such and really kind of giving a you know what people actually think what sustainable space tourism in their opinion, would include. So that's literally just uh, my book's content. And uh, but I think in, in general, it provides. If you have no, most people have no idea what space tourism even involves, and especially when it's tied with sustainable development. So hopefully, when reading this book, uh, I think uh, you get kind of uh, the reader gets a really good general understanding what is the kind of uh, the concept. Yeah, I wrote um, a blog post. Super simple. Um, but just a, a really basic explanation about what is space tourism. And I put in that that it's more, as you mentioned earlier, it's more than just, uh, it, you know, the elite flying into into space. It's mm. also about stargazing and going to, um, you know, space museums. Um, I remember going to a, a museum in, I think I was in Moscow, actually. I, I had no idea where I was in Moscow. I was just walking along and then, all of a sudden there was this huge rocket there. And I was like, oh my God, you know, and, and I didn't really, I still don't really know the, the story of it, but yeah. obviously Russia has a, a, you know, some history in that area and they want to show it off and that's great. But a lot of people, they, when you say space tourism, they just think of people flying into space and, mm. and experiencing that, but actually it is much more than that. And yes. I think that's, that's something that a lot of people don't realize. Mm. Definitely. Have you found that well? Sorry? Have, is that something that you found? 
Yes, it is. And uh, well, most people literally, I mean, obviously you have the visions of the, you know, the, as I mentioned, the Hollywood, uh, you know, kind of Star Trek and all these movies, Ad Astra and such. If you have been watching, we all have a vision how kind of space and kind of being there would be uh, and such. But of course, this kind of as especially now when uh kind of when we have been having this covid situation the pandemic on on the earth and uh i've been thinking in that finland scale like as because we do have these northern lights as a really big uh thing that a lot of people do from all over of the planet just come in lapland and watch the sky anyway so i've been kind of personally thinking that obviously because all these areas uh, of the whole planet have been now suffering of the lack of tourism because simply like the, the airplanes don't fly and all kinds of you know safety health uh health related things now with regulations that you can't actually even come and because of the uh, borders are closed but personally i've been thinking that now when the new space um is going to be a very big thing and obviously for example finland will not have any operation or we don't be having any kind of space part and activity here for a long time at least so just to kind of get people here uh, to tie it up with this new space thing would be really kind of becoming a space tourism country in a way that's really a sustainable way of doing space tourism, watching the Northern Lights. So kind of, uh, you know, marketing and uh, changing the uh, strategy kind of in a way and doing it maybe virtually that there could be a center built in Lapland as well that you can kind of museum of some kind of virtual uh you know experiences tied up and then you would have the northern light so that already could be uh you know really sustainable space activity a space tourism activity that you don't really even leave the planet that's always the most sustainable form but you are still part of the uh the kind of a new space era to come mm. Oh, very interesting. So um, I think you've touched on this um, already, but just to summarise then, how can the space tourism industry be more sustainable overall? Uh, yes. So first about the operational level of sustainability is maybe the key thing that the re re making the, you know, all kinds of uh, uh, designing and operational uh, structuring following the, the current sustainable development uh, kind of guidelines and such, and also the reuse of the rockets, all kinds of new technologies involved in the emissions and such. So uh, that is one part when you think of just the operational activities, then also really investing in the educational sector, because there aren't really any professionals now. This would be, as you think of tourism, nobody really is kind of teaching and doing it yet, except myself and a couple of others. So really Really, you know, giving a chance, giving funding for for educational sector to really, uh, you know, educate the future workers, so they are really aware. So those are, I think, uh, in my opinion, the two kind of uh, big things. Also, if you are a space tourist to become, most likely you have a wealthy uh, background since your ticket will be 250,000. Some kind of, uh, you know, as in aviation, we have these compensation schemes already uh, present that you literally pay for some kind of uh, pollution tax. So that could be a really good start, that especially when uh, kind of, um, I think all the space tourism companies should have such a scheme so that all the tourists can join it and really, you know, uh, compensate uh, the kind of emissions caused. And those could be then uh, uh, forwarded to some uh, benefits of many other environmental projects in, in areas of need on earth. So those could be kind of practical things that could already uh, really advance uh, sustainability in space tourism industry. Yeah, sounds like a great idea. So let's talk a little bit about Virgin Galactic. I think that's probably the most famous company that most people I think have heard of. Um, do you think it's actually going to happen? Because there's been a lot of talk and a lot of hype over the recent years. And yes. it's all gone a bit quiet. Is mm. it going to and when? What do you think? Yes. Well, they obviously like uh, there have been people who uh, bought the ticket already about 10 years ago. So, of course, it has been a long wait. I think it's about 700 people in the in wow. the queue now who have been purchasing it and such. Um, and then obviously they meant to start it already in 2000. Was it 13 or 14? But then in the final testings, they had this accident that a pilot actually died. So, of course, then it delayed the process. You do have a lot of regulations tied up. Obviously, this is an, 
a uh, new uh, kind of uh, alternative tourism activity that has a lot of risks involved. And especially when you think of who will go there first, you are talking now with the elite business owners and such, and you don't want to have the publicity that the first flight with, you know, most influential people, almost in the planet are, you know, just mm -hmm. uh, not coming back. So, of course, then it needs to be yeah. really a uh, safety check. But uh, what I have been now uh, f uh, following this, it looks really, I mean, this is the most promising it has been looking for the past 10 years. And I personally do believe in this year's time, uh, in, in 2021, they will be the first uh, tourism oh, yeah. flight. That soon? But yeah. I, I, well, if it goes like uh, what I have been, you know, so far, I think this is the moment that it looks the most likely to finally happen. Oh, but of wow. course, I don't work for Virgin Galactic and I'm not Richard Branson, but just from the you know angle of what I've been watching this for the past five years, at least now it looks really like all the operation infrastructure is ready. They are really training already these kind of people who go there. Like when you have all that and you are just literally doing the safety checks now and you have the fleet, I mean, it's all there, but you know, the final... Mm -hmm. Uh, flight uh, before, and I, I believe Richard Branson will be in the last test flight himself. But I have understood, so it will be a very, uh, I will be very happy for him because that's something that must be a feeling really great, especially after COVID and of the aviation being in such a terrible state. Uh, it must be very a uh, good feeling. Yeah. Wow. Well, we'll have to keep watching the news for that one then. Uh, so. Do you think space tourism will ever become affordable for the average person? Yes. Um, well, I think like my, I'm now uh, myself um, 43 years old. So I hope that when I kind of retire 70 something, uh, that I would actually be able to do it, uh, like raise a, a glass of champagne in some kind of some kind of a hotel located in a, a low Earth orbit. So that's kind of something. Obviously, that's like thirty years now. When you think of the technology and when you think of these uh, innovations, the rapid progress we have been witnessing already with many technology related things. So it just kind of has to really. Obviously now, for the next five years, it will be a really elite and expensive, but it's just only it's a matter of time if somebody really invents something that, uh, you know, uh, you can really reuse and, you know, it's, it's the kind of um, the fuels are something that is not almost invented yet. But so I actually, based on the technology developments in other sectors, I actually think that I, I my retirement champagne is possible to, to be enjoyed in that moon. <laughs> moon as a, some kind of a nice lounge and watching the earth kind of, and then really thinking of my path as a space researcher, that would be a very, a very unique uh, experience. But of course, it always will be, uh, you know, it won't be the cheap activity for the maybe next 50 years anyway. But it could be something that, like Elon Musk has actually been calculating that when he kind of wants to colonize Mars, that he has literally said like in, you know, only I think it was like 20 years time, that the flight one-way ticket to Mars would be costing maybe $500,000, that you can sell your house on Earth, and then you can literally go and retire on, on the soil of Mars. So when you think of that, that is something that average person in theory could do, especially if you, you know, sell your house and you kind of, so, but of course it's, it's, it's not like something that uh, these low cost airline carriers, we saw that Ryanair five, five euros, uh, you just fly from another country to another, but uh, average person in a way that, you, you know, if you save a lot and you sell your house in that kind of sense, I believe average person could maybe uh, be able to do this in our lifetimes. Mm. And it's amazing, isn't it? When you think about the technological advancements that we've seen in just the last sort of 50 years that the world's a completely different place so where will we be in 50 years time yes could be in space i mean yeah, yeah, <laughs> now, yeah. <laughs> then think of all this kind of virtuality now because of the covid we all had to do this uh huge transformation just to to kind of add like you are Haley now in China and I'm in Finland and we are still talking normally. So I could be in space easily because now when we think of these satellites, what SpaceX is kind of shooting uh, to low Earth orbit as well, it's actually it will be you know 
if you're in space environment, you can literally utilize the same network there as well. So it's kind of, you know, also helping the remote areas of the Earth to can get the internet, but as well as you're in space hotel. So we are kind of, you know, at some point, we don't even know where, but the environment doesn't matter anymore. So it's kind mm -hmm. of, you know, especially the younger generations, they get custom that we may have an avatar or whatever else, it becomes their normal life. And uh, yeah, these are interesting uh, considerations in, in yeah. many kind of ways. Really interesting. So, if there is anyone who is quite interested in working in space tourism, what advice would you give them? Well, I think maybe I, I would first suggest to read my book in a way because that actually will have the collective information of, um, of from the angle of sustainable development because that's a mega trend nowadays in um, in uh, in Earth that every uh, the IPCC report that came out two years ago really shocked uh, you know countries and there's a lot of awareness now of you know the consequences and such, uh, especially the younger generation are really worried. We have this Greta Thunberg movement and all kinds of that. So literally, um, you know, really uh, first, you know, find out what uh, is available, that it's very limited at the moment, but there is now something at least. And then, uh, of course, um, like, uh, uh, this is something because obviously it hasn't started yet and the tourism, it, it's still a small industry in a way. So um, it's just the kind of, you know, maybe become an you know academic researcher yourself, try to maybe select, uh, you know, uh, bachelor's uh, thesis or ma master thesis topic related to new spa space tourism. And then kind of, you know, that like uh, that there will be more academic uh, work produced because there is really a lack at the moment for, for such things. So that's maybe something. And uh, But my in my part, I try to really push this sustainable development and space tourism educational sector as much as I can in the future so maybe you can join my virtual course or something if i start having those at some point so yeah, great so your main advice is is education at the moment and sort of yes maybe try and, and stick with the academic route initially and, and see where the industry's at sorry i have a child pulling on my arm down here this has been really interesting. Um, really interesting talk. Thank you so much. Um, oh, thank you for having me. So for anyone who's listening, next week we have um, a speaker, Jenny Lynn. She is a fellow travel blogger. So I've met her on the travel blogger scene and she focuses uh, she focuses on family travel. Um, quite appropriate saying that and I've got the baby in my arms. Uh, so she's come to talk next week on Friday, so um, just under two weeks' time, actually, because it's Monday today, isn't it? Um, and that'll be 5.15 China time and 10.15 UK time. And um, if you do enjoy um, these talks, you can find them on YouTube. So there's a link to my YouTube channel um, at the bottom there. Do subscribe, um, and you'll get a, a notification when we do new videos. Um, I'm also planning on doing a, a, a new educational series of videos um, that will be coming onto YouTube too. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and then obviously I've got my other social media channels there as well. So thank you so much, Yvette. It's been really interesting. Uh, Yvette, sorry. Yes. I'm, so I'm, so, I'm so sorry. I'm distracted with the baby. <laughs> Annette. <laughs> so thank you so much, Annette. Yes. Um, really interesting. And if anyone has any questions for her, you can find her on LinkedIn. Um, yes or Google space tourism, and I'm sure you'll find her pretty easily because there aren't that many people who have. There is not the competition that much in the, you know, yes. Yeah. So you can Googling is a good way, yes. Great, well, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, if anyone's got any questions, uh, feel free to drop them over. <laughs>